you want to take your Bibles out and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. As we anticipate the birth of Christ, we go through this season that we call Advent. We recognize that Jesus brings us peace and joy and love, and that's what we are going to remember today we're going to talk about joy. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine, and you may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And that's where we'll stop. You believe in him, it says in verse 8 and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Filled with joy. Advent means coming. The coming of Christ, and that brings us joy. When Christ comes into the world, that means joy for us. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid, I bring you good news of great joy. Today, In the town of David, a Savior is born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Joy is kind of a, generally a foreign word in at least the the general culture. It's not as often used as something called happiness. Happiness is what usually we hear about and we kind of confuse happiness with joy, we in the believing community. The Bible doesn't talk a lot about happiness, but it talks a lot about joy. In the mainstream culture, we have, we've run into advertisements all over the place, billboards, TV, magazines, whatever, right? We run into these advertisements all over the place, and most of these advertisements that we run into, most of them, they don't sell a product or service as much as they sell happiness, if you notice that. From soda and alcohol to fashion and automobiles, happiness is offered to us in every purchase. Buy this, you'll be happy. So medicines will turn sad and alone people into people who are laughing and being happy with family and friends. We have people who who are washing themselves in the shower with soap and It looks like they're just having a great time just washing themselves in the shower, right? Who knew that soap could do that? Or maybe a a great example is uh, the Jimmy John's commercials, uh, the ones where Jimmy John's makes kids that are naughty suddenly act really well. Just magic, magic, (laughs) instant happiness, right? Just a few pictures on the screen here for you. 99 cents can buy happiness at Wendy's. This is, this, is what, this is what we hear and what we see. I didn't know happiness costs only 99 cents, but there you go, right there, from, from an authoritative source. All right, hit, hit the next one there. You can't buy happiness, but you can buy tea, and that's kind of the same thing. And I didn't just find this for Lipton tea. This same phrase was on a ton of different other ones too. And I just picked that one to share with you today. One, uh, one more here. Get in and get happy. If you drive a Volkswagen, you just get in, happiness will be with you. It's 
It's magic, right? One more. Here's an instance of joy that I found. I used to eat this yogurt. I haven't for a while, but uh, it says pure joy on the top of that yogurt there. Only the purest ingredients go into this cup, like organic milk from pasture-raised cows. Only pure joy comes out. This is, this is the world that we live in. This is what is billed as happiness and joy. This is not what the Bible says. This is the world that we live in, and this is, I'll, I'll suggest this to you, this is our default setting. If we, if we were not grounded in the Word at all, this is what, how, what we would think. There's a reason why they advertise like this, and it's because it plays on the ways that we already think. Happiness comes from circumstances, but joy comes from heaven. Maybe a good way to summarize it. You are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. An inexpressible joy. A joy that is beyond words, even. The people of First Peter here, they, they did not have very good circumstances at all. You can kind of get that from what we just read a little bit. These people really had little reason to be happy. It says in verse 6 that you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. In fact, the rest of 1 Peter goes back to trials a lot and suffering for Christ a lot. The whole book is really about it. What does it mean to suffer for Christ? The believers of 1 Peter greatly suffered for following Christ. Not unlike the people of Guinea, when you become a Christian, that's hazardous. That can mean a loss of your business. That can mean a loss of all your family and friends. And in some places around the world, that can mean dying, loss of your life. Not unlike the people of First Peter here. For them, being a Christian meant going against the entire fabric of society. It was a different world then than it is now. Let me just try to paint you a picture of it. They had to turn away from worshiping other gods. All right? they, they lived in a society where there were gods all over the place. There was a god for every facet of your life entirely. So they had gods for your family. They had gods for your line of work. And they had gods for the city and a god for the empire, as well as just general gods up there too. So... You had gods that you were supposed to be worshiping in every facet of your life. To stop worshiping all of those gods, that's going against the whole fabric of society. That's not received very well. The gods that they had, they united everybody. They brought people together. To go against them was to break everybody apart. Turning away from all these gods is like turning against everything. So that means you're turning against the family, you're turning against the company, you're turning against your community, your city, and your nation. All right, now, we don't like it when people are anti-American, when they burn flags or when they kneel for the pledge, or not the pledge, the uh, national anthem, or refuse to say the pledge people, when people insult people in the military. We don't like that, do we? Multiply that by maybe 10 times and you get an idea of what it was like to be a Christian back then. You were going against the whole fabric of society. This is even more outrageous. Not only were you in an honor-shame culture, this is another difference. Back then, going along was prized. Here, we kind of assume that everybody's their own person and people kind of think a little differently and kind of go their own ways a little bit. But back then, going along, that was everything. If you didn't go along, that was shame. And that was, you, you would rather be destitute and poor than shamed back then. Honor and shame was the most valued thing back then. 
So, for them, these gods that they worshipped, they really held everything together. And to go against them was to go against everyone. So God's kept your family healthy. It brought you respect. It made your business succeed. So if you're going against the God of your, your business, your line of work, then you're against the company. They protected your city from trouble and invasion and collapse, which was constantly a threat. And uh, the gods made peace for the empire. They were major troublemakers in their communities. And they were not received very well. And somehow they are still filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Somehow. Their circumstances weren't that great. But they had Jesus Christ. And just because of that, they were filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. It's hard to see that unless we have our good circumstances taken from us, isn't it? When things are going well, when there's food in our stomachs and warm houses to live in and people around us that care about us, it's kind of easy to, to forget what joy Christ brings to us. But we're going to remember that. Jesus Christ is God's gift of joy to us. Jesus wasn't a baby in a manger for somebody else. For them, back then, Jesus is joy for us today. Verse 3. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead, and therefore we have a living hope. When Jesus came to this world, that means that we have a living hope. Because he is going to save us from our sins. There are people who pray around the world to ancestors or, or saints or people that have gone before us. And their bodies are in the ground. There, there are people out there who pray to, to people who are basically dead. Jesus Christ is not a body in the ground. His body is was raised from the dead. We have a living hope. In verse 4, into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. In Jesus, we have a heavenly inheritance. Not like an inheritance that we would have here. Nothing like that. There's a lot of times that we set our energies on getting stuff here. So we're, we set our energies on getting the latest and greatest of phones and cars or video games or tools, boats, whatever. And all of these will wear out. They'll depreciate in value. The things of heaven, though, are not subject to moss, moth, rust, or thieves. The things of heaven are these. Here's a few examples. The glory of being in the presence of Christ. To see his face. Nothing compares to that. Or to stand before the judge of the whole earth. The perfect judge, not subject to any biases or anything like that, and to have him say, you are forgiven. To be reunited with loved ones who have gone before us, who we've lost. And to fully experience love that's not like the love that we have, but love that's divine We have, we have some good relationships here and we experience love in that way, but this is all still human love. 
God's love is divine. It's perfect. We can't, we can't even imagine that. That is heavenly treasure. Nothing on earth can compare to heaven. And in Christ, it's ours. It's our inheritance. We're not holding it in our hands yet, but it belongs to us. Jesus told this brief parable, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. The things that are waiting for us in heaven are worth every last thing that we have here on earth. It may be hard for us to understand, but that's the reality of it. In verse 8 it says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. That is amazing. We love the Lord Jesus Christ. We've never seen him. Sure, he, he, he lives in our hearts, he, he walks with us, but we have not seen him. All of our, our hopes and dreams are in somebody that we've, we've never seen. And yet we still believe in him. We still love him. And we are still filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy about him. That's pretty incredible. Jesus, in fact, is so wonderful. And this gospel of grace is so amazing that if we were not aided by the Holy Spirit, we would never believe it ourselves. It's too good to be true. When we encounter something that's too good to be true, we usually be like, okay, yeah, that can't be true. But this is. It's amazing that we believe this. We've never seen Jesus, but believing in him gives us an inexplicable joy. Now, when we're children and we have Christmas and, and we're excited about getting gifts and stuff like that, or at least, at least I was, I remember that, um, I was mostly excited about the gifts. And yes, yes, there was Christmas is about Jesus and that's the reason for the season and all that, but, but the presents, that's what's really exciting. Um, as I've gotten older, there's still an excitement about Christmas, but it's kind of shifted. There's not really a lot of things out there that I want anymore, but, but there's still an excitement about, about Christmas time that's like, <clears throat> Jesus is here. And he doesn't, he doesn't put stuff under the tree, but he fulfills all the longings of our soul. All of our, the things on our grown-up Christmas list. He's the answer to those. He's the gift that we've always wanted. Look at the screen here with me if you would. Why is the Son of God called Jesus, meaning Savior? Because he saves us from our sins. Salvation cannot be found in anyone else. It is futile to look for any salvation elsewhere. He is our salvation. He is everything that we want. Now, maybe you believe in Christ, but it don't, doesn't really bring you a lot of joy. Maybe it's mostly in your head. Um, I remember what that was like and, and uh, still... Still trying to get out of that a little bit too. Um, it's easy to just kind of believe in Jesus and think, oh, that's nice. And, and uh, but most of that's for later. You know, that's kind of hard to be joyful about stuff you don't have yet, right? But maybe there is joy there in your heart and you just don't notice it. We will know joy the more we know Jesus. We need to grow in our knowledge of him, in our walk with him. And the more we do that, it's always a process. The more we do that, the more joy we will have. 
Joy doesn't come simply from thinking happy thoughts like the Peter Pan thing. It doesn't come from just looking on the bright side of things. That's not what joy comes from. Joy comes from focusing on Christ himself. Knowing him, trusting him, and walking with him. The more you focus on Christ himself, the more joy that you will have. The same, the same woman who taught us a few weeks back to give thanks even for the fleas is also an example of, of this kind of joy, of focusing on who Jesus is. This woman's name is Betsy. The biggest problem at this point was Betsy's strength. One morning after a hard night's rain, we arrived to find the ground sodden and heavy. Betsy had never been able to lift much. Today, her shovelfuls were microscopic, and she stumbled frequently as she walked to the low ground where we dumped the loads. A guard screamed at her, Can't you go faster? Why must they scream, I wondered, as I sank my shovel into the black muck. Why couldn't they speak like ordinary human beings? I straightened slowly, the sweat drying on my back. Loafer, lazy swine! The guard snatched Betsy's shovel from her hands and ran from the group to the group of the giggling crew, exhibiting a handful of dirt that was all Betsy that had been able to lift. Look what Madame Baroness is carrying. Surely she will overexert herself. The other guards and even some of the prisoners laughed. Encouraged, the guard threw herself into a parody of Betsy's faltering walk. As the laughter grew... I felt a murderous anger rise. The guard was young and well-fed. Was it Betsy's fault that she was old and starving in this concentration camp? But to my astonishment, Betsy, too, was laughing. That's me, all right, she admitted. But you'd better let me totter along with my little spoonful, or I'll have to stop altogether. The guard's plump cheek went crimson. I'll decide who's to stop. And snatching a leather crop from her belt, she slashed Betsy across the chest and neck. Without knowing I was doing it, I had seized my shovel and rushed at her. Betsy stepped in front of me before anyone had seen. Corey, she pleaded, dragging my arm to my side. Corey, keep working. She tugged the shovel from my hand and dug it into the mud. Contemptuously, the guard tossed Betsy's shovel toward us. I picked it up, still in a daze. A red stain appeared on Betsy's collar. A welt began to swell on her neck. Betsy saw where I was looking and laid a bird-thin hand over the whip mark. Don't look at it, Corey. Look at Jesus only. She drew away her hand. It was sticky with blood. Look at Jesus only. Betsy would die in that camp about a month later from sickness and malnutrition. And even so, she's saying, look at Jesus only. We have dismay when we look around us. If you look around us, there's a lot of things to be worried about, a lot of things that disappoint us, a lot of things that discourage us. Same for Betsy here. But we have joy when we look at Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The joy set before him. How do you find joy? Concentrate on Jesus and dwell on what he means. Dwell on who he is and everything that he means for you. 
Here's just a few, few examples here. Jesus means God loves us enough to join us, to be one of us, to breathe this air and to walk on this earth, to be subject to our diseases and all of our troubles and all of our temptations. He joined us. God doesn't leave us in our misery. He joins us in it. He's here. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. God is with us. We can rejoice in that. Emmanuel, God with us. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. He's here. We can rejoice in that. Jesus here means God is putting a stop to sin and all of the havoc that it wrecks all over this earth. God is putting a stop to it. This is the beginning of the end. This is D-Day here. It's all going to be better from here. God has not forgotten us. Jesus, when he came, he healed the sick. He restored broken bodies. He made friends of enemies. He gave value to outcasts. And he gave hope to hopeless people. His whole life was just one blessing after another for everyone. And Jesus means victory. Not just any victory. This means that our grief in all kinds of trials is going to result in praise, glory, and honor. That's victory. Those things that weigh us down, that make us miserable, are going to be our moments of triumph later because of what Jesus has done. Just like the cross was the lowest of the low points in human history, it's now something we celebrate. The lowest of our low moments are going to be someday our greatest victory, just like the cross was. Jesus means our troubles become triumphs, our shame becomes honor, and our death becomes life. He reverses it. That's amazing. Joy to the world. This Christmas season, open God's gift of joy. Jesus is God's gift to us. Let's unwrap that gift. Let's not leave it under the tree. He is the answer to all the needs of our souls. Let's bow our heads. Lord, our God in heaven, thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for all that he is. Help us to keep our eyes on him and not to be dismayed by all of the trouble that is around us and in this world. Remind us, Lord, that that we have the victory in you. And Lord, make this Christmas season a joyful time for us because of what you have done. In the name of Jesus, amen.